meditation of my heart be always acceptable in my sight, O oh Lord, my strength and redeemer. Amen. We children of God can be a rather frustrating lot. Why do I say this? Well, because we really seem to like limit and label. And we like it so much, we'll even label what is or is not correct about religious practice. And then limit what can or cannot be done. And that's at least one of the things that's going on in today's gospel. You heard, we heard, that Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath. And he is teaching about God. And when he is doing that, a woman who is so crippled with illness that she was bent over shows up. And remember, it was common at that time to blame people for whatever illnesses they had. In some way, they had sinned. And in my mind, when I think of this story, I see her quietly hobbling in when it's late. And then she's looking for a seat way in the back because she doesn't want anybody to see her. But Jesus sees her. And he calls her out and beckons her to come up to him. And he puts his hands on the woman and he heals her. Right there in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the woman began praising God, and you'd think the whole congregation would stand up and praise God with her, but no. Why? Because the synagogue leader was all in on a shape with the people and with Jesus, not for healing, <coughs> but for working on the Sabbath. And he had a point. The Tanakh. The Jewish Bible says right there in the book of Exodus that the Sabbath is a holy day and God's people are not to do work. Now here's where we need to remember and keep in mind an admonition that the Bible is not meant to be an instruction book, but rather a way to dialogue with God. Because what did Jesus do? Let's start a dialogue. He points out to the synagogue leader that he, the synagogue leader, he himself, works on the Sabbath. How? By taking care of the four-legged creatures that God has created. And then Jesus asks, isn't this creature, a daughter of Abraham, as important to God as the four-legged creatures? So in other words, he was saying that the leader of the synagogue was guilty of limiting and labeling, labeling and limiting who or what was worthy and when. And we still limit and label. Now one of my most favorite contemporary authors writes about that very thing, limiting and labeling. Now when I first picked up the book, I was rather taken aback because I looked at her picture. Now by that time in my life, I was pretty cool, and I was accustomed to seeing tattoos, whole sleeves of tattoos on men, but not so much on women. However, by the time I opened that book and I got to the third page, I was hooked on that book. Because it turns out that before she became a stand-up comic, and before she became really, really, really good friends with drugs, and before she was homeless, she was a much-loved child of God, and she had been baptized. But she fell away from the church for various reasons. One of them being she didn't feel she fit in, and another was that she felt she was a disappointment to God. And then one day, after waking up and discovering that she was not dead by age 30, she joined AA and began the road to recovery. And while it took her sweat and her effort and her determination to stay on that road, she fully credits God for being with her all of the time. 
It was the grace of God, you know, that grace when God is good to us, even if we don't deserve it. It was that grace of God that she credits. She said it wasn't hopefulness or positive thinking. And she got her life back. Then one day at the volleyball court, she met a man who took Matthew chapter 25 as seriously as she did. Like her, he believed that when we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and care for the sick, we do so for Jesus' own sake. And she ended up marrying him, even though he was in the seminary. And she became, with all those tattoos, a pastor's wife. And then, after some discernment, she too became a pastor. Even though initially she felt she was a pretty lousy candidate, because in her own words she says, she swore like a truck driver, was covered in tattoos, and was kind of selfish, she said. And if you have guessed that I am talking about Nadia Holtz Weber, you're correct. She is an ordained Lutheran pastor, and she went on to found a church in Denver. And this church is called the House for All Saints and Sinners. And this congregation includes, among various others, it includes gays, trans, drag queens, and even straights. But like Nadia herself, what they had in common was that they all had been told or felt that they were not up to snuff in the eyes of God. And after a few years, this church became nationally known and noticed by others, by folks who loved them, and by folks who hated them. Now, Pastor Nadia loved her congregation, and she wanted to protect him and protect them from those others. So, she says, she began labeling and sorting others into the bad and the good. Now, the bad were the conservatives who hated gays and the diverse and, and the marginalized. And the good were the liberals who loved the gays, the poor, and the marginalized. It went on and on, and finally one day, after one of her more colorful truck driver worded rants, her husband Matthew, and remember he was a Lutheran pastor, said, Nadia, that is the problem. Every time we draw a line between us and others, Jesus is always on the other side. And that's the truth, isn't it? Every time we label and limit, like the synagogue leader did, and every time we draw a line, we find Jesus on the other side. And every time we, every time I, label and limit the grace and mercy and love of God and draw that line like Nadia did, is when I find Jesus on the other side. But even then, God being God still freely gives us grace and love, healing us like Jesus healed the woman in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And isn't that good news? Amen. Amen. Amen.